Well, last week I went to the Austin Bergstrom Airport uh, to pick up my daughter Vicki and her family who were arriving from Wisconsin for our family wedding. Of course, I couldn't just pull up to the curb and wait till they walked inside. I made Kevin drop me off and he got to go sit in the cell phone lot while I waited anxiously at the bottom of the escalator watching to see them come down. And the airport was incredibly busy, as it always is. And there were lots and lots and lots of people. And I just kept scanning the crowd. And, and when I'd see somebody with a baby, I'd kind of do a double take just in case maybe I didn't recognize my own granddaughter like that would happen. But um, quite honestly, I didn't see everybody who was rushing around, the ones I didn't know. I just kept looking through the crowd for a familiar face until all of a sudden there was that beautiful smile at the top of the escalator and I saw Vicky whispering to Athena, my one-year-old granddaughter, pointing at me, and she broke into this big grin, and everything else disappeared. All I saw was my precious family coming down the escalator. Think about the last time you were in a busy airport. Think of all the noise, hundreds of people talking and music and announcements and the luggage sound and so much to see and so much to hear. But how much that you see do you actually process? Or how much that the sound do you actually hear? But then maybe an announcement comes on and it says your name or, or it says your flight number and all of a sudden you are on. Man, you are hearing what is said, right? Well, there's a reason for that. It's called your reticular activating system. Y'all know about that? Who knows about that here? A few of you know about that. Yeah, you know. <laughs> I heard, I saw a reference to that, so I looked it up and did research. Very interesting. It's that automatic mechanism inside your brain that brings relevant information to your attention. It's kind of like a filter um, between your conscious mind and your subconscious mind. So the reticular activating system allows us to filter through all that sensory stimuli that is around us and focus on what's important to us okay so we focus on what's important to us so that afternoon in the airport the only thing that was really important to me was my daughter and her husband and my granddaughter I didn't notice everybody else now it's really a necessary part of our brain function there's so much stimuli out there that our brains would just explode if we actually focused on every single thing out there and while that's a really good thing sometimes it can be a little bit of a problem. Last Christmas, right before Christmas, I was uh, desperately trying to fly, fly, find gluten-free cornbread mix because my daughter Vicky is gluten intolerant. And uh, she was coming for Christmas, and we always have turkey and stuff dressing, and we have to have cornbread stuffing because that's what we do in our family. And uh, of course, I'd waited until the last minute to find gluten-free cornbread mix. And I'd been to one store, and they didn't have it, so I was a little bit frantic. And I'd gone up to HEB at University Commons, which is not that close to me, and I'd finally found the gluten-free aisle. And I was standing there just really intently looking at all those boxes when all of a sudden I heard Joy, do you remember this, Joy, say, Hi, Nancy. And I'm like, <laughs> there were Brad and Joy, like, right next to me, and I was there just so intent on my silly gluten-free cornbread mix. I didn't even notice my good friends right by me. Have you ever had that happen? Yeah, yeah. Well, today we read a story about someone else whose reticular activating system uh, kept him from seeing. This story or parable, now remember this is a parable, which means this didn't literally happen. This is a story that Jesus told to explain something. Well, in this story there are two men Neighbors, I guess we could say, they lived right by each other. And there's an unnamed rich man and a named poor man. What's his name? Lazarus, okay? Pretty quickly, Jesus knows that these two men are kind of like on the opposite end of the spectrum. Lazarus lives outside the gate. Actually, the text literally says that he was thrown outside the gate, kind of like a piece of insignificant trash, and inside the gate lived a very wealthy man. And just the fact that he had a gate at his home, we know he is wealthy. Cities had gates. Very few homes in those days had gates. So we know he is wealthy. So inside the gate, this wealthy man wore 
purple and fine linen to cover his skin. Outside the gate, Lazarus' skin was covered with what? Sores. Inside the gate, the rich man ate sumptuously, it tells us. Can't you, don't you get a visual of that? He ate sumptuously every day. And outside the gate, Lazarus longed and hungered for even the droppings from this man's table. Inside the gate, the household pets laid claim to those droppings. But outside the gate, the street dogs did what to Lazarus? Licked his sores. Does that sound disgusting? Yeah. Eventually, Lazarus dies and an angel, we're told an angel carries him to heaven. So that is a euphemism in those days to let us know there was no funeral. No funeral. But the rich man died and we're told was buried. So we know there was a proper funeral, probably big production with all the proper burial rites and the right people. So even in death, they're opposites. Even after death, they're opposites. Except it seems like things have changed a little bit. Lazarus is sitting in the lap of Abraham and the rich man is in Hades. Now a couple things to remember. All Jews believe they were children of Father Abraham. And anyone who was a faithful Jew would be in the bosom of Abraham when they went to heaven. And all Jews believed that if they were wealthy, it was because they pleased God. God had given them their wealth, and they were especially righteous because God had blessed them with wealth. Now, the poor, particularly those with sores, were seen to be cursed by God, punished by God for some sin. You remember Job when he's covered with sins? What did his friends say? What did you do wrong to have all these sores on you? Well, from his realm of torment in Hades, the rich man looks up and he sees Father Abraham and he can't believe his eyes because there in Abraham's arms is that poor beggar who had laid at his gate. This man of no importance. While the rich man suffered, Abraham was in glory. But wait, hadn't, hadn't his riches proved God's love to him? Why is he in Hades? So the rich man calls out, Father Abraham, send Lazarus just to dip the tip of his finger in water and touch my tongue. Did you notice that Lazarus, I mean, that the rich man doesn't ask Lazarus? He asks Abraham? You see, the rich man still didn't get it. Pastor and writer and professor Barbara Brown Taylor describes it this way. She writes, even from the far side of the grave, the rich man doesn't recognize the poor man as a fellow human being. He still sees him <coughs> excuse me, as something less. He thinks Lazarus is Father Abraham's gopher, someone to fetch water or take a message to somebody. But Jesus says Father Abraham is going to set him straight cradling old bony Lazarus in his arms. He says, no, 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 no. Rich man's days of getting other people to do their bidding is over. Furthermore, there are going to be no special messages brought back from the dead for his brothers. They had the prophets and the uh, Moses just like everyone else. And if that's not enough to get their attention, no ghost is going to get it either. The end. Of course, Jesus in telling this story knows that he will come back from the dead and they still won't get it. For centuries, the prophets had called the people to live out their faith by the way they treated the other. They'd heard the words. They talked about doing mercy and loving kindness and walking humbly with their God, but they didn't do it. You know, so often we think this parable is about money and how we use it. And we can get kind of smug about that. Because here at Grace, we give 10% of all our money to mission. Um, throughout the Bible, we're told to give our first fruits to God, that 10%. And so here as a church, we say part of our DNA is that we recognize that everything we have is from God. So for every dollar that comes into this church, we give 10 cents outside the, this congregation for those in need. We're considered a tithing church. And look at the way we respond with mission. I mean, we collected 34 coats. 
And I know you just think this is a bunch of junk up here, but if you come up here, you'll see there's a bag full of toiletries for the homeless. Yesterday, we had people handing out clothes and toiletry to the homeless. They handed out 75 pairs of socks and ran out of socks and underwear. This Sunday, our coming Sunday, our youth are going to feed the homeless on Sunday morning. We have people who, um, who go to the serving center and work handing out food. We have a woman, Mary Milligan, who's really ill. She's undergoing chemotherapy, and what is she doing? She is knitting hats for the homeless. Instead of feeling sorry for herself, she is doing something to reach out to somebody outside. We have people who make blankets for those undergoing chemotherapy. We had a group this summer that went down to the Rio Grande Valley and built ramps for folks who had no way to get inside their homes. We drive senior citizens to doctor's appointments in the grocery store. So we don't feel too bad when we read this passage because we're not the rich man, are we? We do good things here. Except, when really honest with ourselves, we might wonder, now, why did that rich man end up in Hades? It's not like he did something bad. We're not told he did something bad. What were his shortcomings? The Bible commentator William Barclay once called this passage the punishment of a man who never noticed. The punishment of a man who never noticed. Martin Luther King once preached a sermon on that. Actually, it was at Montreat uh, Presbyterian Conference Grounds in North Carolina. And he said, The rich man went to hell not because he was rich, but because he passed by Lazarus every day and he never really saw him. You see, this parable isn't about being rich and poor. It's about whether we can pass a vision test whether we can intentionally override our reticular activating system so that we see. I mean, we do it all the time for things that are really important to us. Dr. King went on to say in that sermon that the rich man went to Hades because he allowed Lazarus to become invisible. In fact, he didn't even realize that Lazarus was his brother. You see, when we succeed in cutting ourselves off from one another when we learn how to live with the misery of other people by convincing ourselves that somehow they deserve it, when you defend our own good fortune as God's blessing and we rationalize that we don't need to do anything to help those who are hurting, we fail to see how our lives are knit together with every other life and then we are the losers. We've allowed our reticular activating system to keep us from being in community. So let me ask you a question. Are there people in your world that you don't even see? Needy people? Hurting people? People who need your attention? They may not be covered with sores, but have you seen the hurt in their eyes? Do you walk on by or do you stop and talk? One of the most colorful congressman from Texas to ever go to Washington, D.C. was a crusty old gentleman named Sam Rayburn. Ah, some of you remember. He served Congress for over 50 years, and during the last of those years, he was Speaker of the House. Well, one day, Mr. Rayburn heard that a teenage daughter of a Washington reporter had died. And so early the next morning, he went and knocked on the front door of that man's house. And he said, I just came by to see what I could do to help. Now think about that. You're just a reporter in Washington, D.C., and the Speaker of the House knocks on your front door. The reporter was obviously touched. He said, "Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, but I don't think there's anything you can do. All the arrangements are being made. Thank you. And so Sam Rayburn said, well, let me ask you, have you had your coffee yet this morning? No. Well, would you allow me to make that for you? And so Sam Rayburn went into his kitchen and fix coffee. And the reporter was really (laughs) taken back by all this because he knew the involvements of Sam Rayburn. And he said, Mr. Speaker, I thought you were having breakfast with the president at the White House this morning. And Mr. Rayburn said, well, I was. But I called the president and I told him I had a friend who was having a tough time and I couldn't make it today. Sam Rayburn noticed. And he saw someone hurting and he acted in love. 
Mother Teresa once wrote, the greatest disease in the West today is not TB or leprosy. It's being unwanted, unloved, and uncared for. We can cure physical diseases with medicine, but the only cure for loneliness, despair, and hopelessness is love. A therapist once said to me, it doesn't really matter if you love someone. What matters if they realize that you love them. If they realize you love them by the way you treat them, by what you do, by your actions. What really matters if people know you love them. Friends, Lazarus is sitting at your gate and at mine. Do you see him? What does he need from you? You know, God has noticed us. God has welcomed us and accepted us. In fact, God became one of us and gave his very all so that we could have abundant life. And he calls us to share that love with others. What are you going to do? Can you pass the vision test? Let us pray. Gracious God, it is so easy for us to get busy and not notice the pain around us. But Lord, you have noticed us and loved us and cared for us. So God, help us open our eyes to those around us who just need a hug or a kind word or just some time to sit down and talk. Help us not to pass on by those in need. May we truly see. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.